Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 278, featuring the third installment of my interview with Mr. Ed Fries, of, uh, formerly of Microsoft Game Studios. In this part of the interview, we talk more about the Xbox, specifically the, the launch, and all the skepticism that existed at the time about uh, Microsoft's chances in a, a market dominated by the Japanese. Uh, we get into the differences, too, in between the uh, Japanese uh, gaming scene and industry versus the uh, American scene, really interesting stuff, and much, much more. Anyway, we've got a lot of stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Ed Freeze. So you mentioned that Bill Gates was not happy that it didn't have the, the full version of Windows on it, but you know, I still think that it was close enough to the PC architecture that it wasn't nearly a, so difficult for these uh, PC game developers, right? They could, e they could easily make ports of their games, Bioware and all the stuff for the Xbox. We're asked to try to port it to the PS uh, or the PlayStation would have been a huge undertaking, right? And that was part of the design from from the get-go, part of the philosophy, right? It was, and it, it was part of the reason I agreed originally to support this because I had a huge PC development group at that time, and uh, we didn't know anything about working on consoles. So the idea that we could work on this machine that looked a lot like a PC was very interesting to us. You weren't concerned. I mean, how do you take it when people said, "Well, the Xbox is just a piece, just a PC in disguise"? You know, did, did, did you care, or is it <laughs> like, "Well, so what"? <laughs> I mean, do, how do you define in your mind the difference between a computer and a console? I, I don't think it matters, honestly. I don't think customers care. Mm -hmm. I mean, what they what they care about is, does it work? Does you can turn it on? It runs. Can I put in it? a disc and have a great experience. That's what they care about. And, um, you know, ultimately that's what we needed to deliver to be successful. So I, we faced a ton of skepticism all the way through. And I had, ever since I had taken over the games group, faced skepticism. Microsoft in the video game business, what does Microsoft know about games? And sort of one by one, I had to sort of convinced the press that actually I have a long history in games, I know a lot about games, I care about games, I want to make great games, we have good partners, we're doing cool stuff. Went through those battles for a long time yeah, in the PC space. And so it just felt like an extension of that when we were going into Xbox. Okay, here's all the skepticism again. What does Microsoft know about the console game space? What is Microsoft, why, is, why does Microsoft want to be in this business? And you know, just had to convince people that actually I'm a gamer at heart, I care about games, my group is built to gamers, we want to make great game experiences, and that's what we're going to deliver to people. And then to start to actually show product that, that backs that up. Um, but the other thing that was hard at that time was Xbox really represented a paradigm shift in where console gaming was going. I mean, console gaming up to that point had really been driven by Japan. And it had a Japanese aesthetic to it. PC gaming, which was more where I was from, was very different. You know, our, you know, PC RPG is very different than Japanese RPGs, right? PC gaming, what was hot was games like Doom and Quake, first-person shooter, networked first-person shooters, where you're playing multiplayer. Nothing like that really existed on the console. It had Golden Eye, which is, you know, not networked and. Um, at least showed you could do a first-person shooter. But then we're coming out and going, hey, we have this first-person shooter that's really great for this console. And a lot of the press said, basically took that as proof that we didn't know what we were doing. It's like, you clearly don't understand the console space. This is a space of colorful Mario-type games, and you're coming out with this you know, kind of gritty uh, sci-fi first-person shooter. You, you guys are like on your own planet. Um, and, um, you know, you hear that enough times from enough press and you start to wonder, man, maybe they're right. Maybe we don't know what we're doing. We certainly were new to the console space. Um, but we were building what we were building and, um, and it was either going to be successful or it wasn't. And fortunately, um, 
you know, we had the right product at the right time for people. And I think it's really changed what console gaming is all about. I mean, um, made it more American, more uh, more like PC gaming, kind of closed that gap. It's been good. Yeah, it's interesting to me, this, this cultural rift that exists between Japan and, and the West in terms of games. It's my understanding that even still have a real deep-seated uh, prejudice against any games made in America or, I guess, Europe to do. But you think that's getting better, or is it getting worse, or is it unchanged? And why, why does it even exist? I spent a lot of time in Japan. Um, it, I love the culture in Japan. Uh, it's a very playful culture. Uh, it's very fun to go visit. Um, huge respect for many of the designers over there and the great products that they built. Um, but it, what's happened is video games have gotten higher and higher budget, more and more realistic, more and more sophisticated. And as that's happened, they start to look kind of like more and more like movies. And so that in effect, they become more culturally relevant. I mean, when it's just some pixels, it's, the culture doesn't come into it as much, but when it's characters and story, um, it starts to feel like you're watching a Japanese movie as opposed to watching a Hollywood movie. And I think um, that affects people. I mean, there's a lot of people who like Japanese anime. I, I like anime, it's cool, but it doesn't, you know, it has a foreign feel to it, right? Like watching a French film, you know, it's you know immediately it's made in France, you know. Yeah, you um, tend to know immediately though. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, um, so it, it's weird. It's almost like as if we had, as if the only movies that people grew up on in America were anime. And then all of a sudden, you know, somebody came out with Back to the Future or something. I don't know, some American movie, <laughs> whatever, choose your Star Wars. You know, it'd be like, whoa. Uh, it, it, it becomes cultural. It becomes culturally relevant. I think that's the core thing. Um, and I think that's part of why Japan has struggled, actually, as a game developer more recently, because the product is inherently more culturally relevant. Um, and, and in a way, we can ride on the back of sort of the, the global movie business. You know, I mean, it's not just that movies are American. It's that that American taste has sort of been exported around the world. And so when we make a game that has that sort of Hollywoodish feel, it it it's more universal than the Japanese one, even though it's just as much a, a product of one culture. It's just that culture has been sort of exported more broadly. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, perfect sense. Yeah. So I wanted to talk, focus in a little bit on uh, Xbox Live because I don't know if you've seen our. You know, we've got a book, vintage game consoles. I don't know if you've seen that. Maybe I send you a copy. Yeah, send me a copy. I, I do a lot of 2600 work, as you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got that. It's, it's on here. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, we argued in that book that Xbox Live was really key. Yeah. And uh, the gambling on the broadband, because I had, you know, the Ethernet port instead of the dial-ups like the, the Dreamcast had. Yeah. I mean, first of all, you know, would you agree? Would you agree with that? You know, I kind of, you know, in our view, it kind of uh, replicates that sort of cultural environment of the early arcades in the 80s, sort of bringing that sort of competitive experience? Yeah. Um, first of all, you know, credit to Robbie Bach. He, you know, my boss at that time, he was the one, you know, I remember the meeting where we were fighting about whether we should have a modem or not, or just go broadband, and he was the one who really put his foot down and said, no, we're going to bet on the future and go broadband only. That was a big gamble at that time. And uh, it was, you know, in retrospect, clearly the right decision. So, um, so give him credit for that. Xbox Live itself was built in Jay Allard's team, and they did a great job. And it's still a model for, um, you know, I think it's still the leader for what console multiplayer gaming can be. The thing is, all of that was influenced by what was happening in the PC side, you know. Networked PC play at that time was very common. I mean, you know, 
Command and Conquer you can, or Age of Empires, we've been doing that for years. Doom, Quake, all those things. So it was the world we were used to. And the fact that it didn't exist in the console seemed strange and a missed opportunity. Um, and so I don't think it took great insight to say this is something that shouldn't exist. And, and, and to be fair, people had tried to do it in many consoles before it, including Dreamcast. But I don't know, Xbox Live, the hardware was the right time, the software was done right, and so it was really the first time it really worked well, I think. I was reading that you had some struggles with Electronic Arts. I guess they had their own sort of online service they were trying to push, and they didn't want to come on board with Xbox Live. It's not so much that they had their own service. It's that they were the biggest publisher. And they their point failed of, the Dreamcast, right, by refusing to yeah. put, game, put their sports games on there. Their point of view, which I really completely understand, is let me get this straight. Okay? You want us to support this new service that you're going to provide. It's a subscription service. So you want us to put all of our multiplayer games on your service. You're going to charge people a certain amount per month, and you're not going to give any of that money to us, and we're going to be the ones who are going to make it be successful. When you put it that way, it's a pretty fair point. That's, that was their core point. And, um, and I was sympathetic to their point. Um, after, um, after we launched... We, before we launched Xbox, I was solely focused on first party. But after we launched Xbox, third party moved from Jay Allard to me. So third party means, for people who don't know, relationships with other publishers. So whether you're working with Electronic Arts, Capcom, Ubisoft, all those guys. So it's kind of weird to have both first and third under the same person because in a sense I was competing with them with my products um, and also trying to encourage them to work on the platform that more or less worked it out. Um, anyway, so I was sympathetic to EA's point of view. And, and we made uh, changes to the terms of the Xbox Live agreement so that there was opportunity for them to share in the success of Xbox Live. And I think that that was a fair deal. I think they were right to ask for it, and I think we were right to give it to them. Another point about Xbox Live, I'm curious about it. I guess initially there was the the plan was to have the Windows gamers and the Xbox gamers all on the all playing these games online. You know, just no no problem. You want to play on the PC, you want to play on the Xbox, fine. Everybody will be in the same space. But uh, somehow that got nixed. You know, I mean, what, what happened? Yeah, it's a better question for Jay Allard than me. Um, it had to do with security within the uh, Xbox Live server system. Um, I was in your camp. I mean, I, in fact, I was in my job as head of third party representing people like Square who wanted to do Final Fantasy XI, and they wanted to do exactly that. And, and so I was on their side campaigning for cross-platform you know, play between PC and Xbox Live. Um, and, you know... Sometimes you hear no, can't do it, won't be. Po it's technically not possible, and you know. And sometimes that's just an excuse. Somebody doesn't want to do it or deal with the issues or whatever. So I don't know. I, I still don't know the answer to this day about why why that was such a hard problem. What kind of relationships did you have with the you know these various studios that were acquired? Just kind of you know how did it work out? They, I know you said many times in other interviews how you've had to really push you got a lot of uh, pushback about trying to rush these guys and you're always on the side of no let's just let them take however long it takes to get the to get the game we want I'm just kind of wondering how the dynamic worked between the publishers and the developer well you, you can ask them it probably work better sometimes than others um, you know I, I I think I try to be sympathetic um, Game development is one of the hardest things you can do, um, combining art and technology in a, in a product is really, really hard. Um, so the challenge when you're running a portfolio like that is you're trying to bring out certain products every quarter and you're trying to you know, meet deadlines and you have things like advertising that has to be done, uh, <laughs> ready to go when the product ships and there's, anyway, 
blah, blah, blah. It gets logistically complicated. And so trying to manage that and also manage the creative process is the hard part of that. It sounds, it sounds incredibly stressful to me. Particularly your role. I mean, you must have been constantly stressed out about these, these <laughs> Christmas seasons and all that. I well, I try not to be a super stressed out kind of guy, first of all. Um, but um, in a way, it was an awesome job. I mean, I got to fly around the world, meet with all the best game developers, see their products and their development, encourage them to continue to make them better, try to find them more money to make them cooler. Um, I, I could be very supportive. Um, and, uh, and so it was fun. Uh, there were times when it was stressful. Um, the, for me, the worst time was just before I quit. <laughs> so I guess that makes sense. And that was when we had had a lot of success. And it was almost the opposite of when I first came to the games group. Going to the games group, people are like, no one cares about what you're going to do. Uh, why would you leave the company to go work on something nobody cares about? And then after Xbox had been so successful and so important to the company, all of a sudden everybody cared about what I was doing. <laughs> and it was like there were all these people with opinions about, you know, how come you're not doing this or why are you doing that and blah, blah, blah. And it just got very old for me. Uh, it was like I've run this business for almost 10 years now without interference why do I have to put up with all this crap now, basically? And, uh, you know, ultimately it was just too much for me. That's ultimately why I left. It was just like, I mean, as a famous story I told about, um, about Halo 2, where Halo 2 got really screwed up in its development. And, um, and I dug into the product with Jason Jones, who's the real creator of Halo, and... Um, we decided we needed to spend an extra year on the product to get it right. And um, went to my boss and explained the situation to him. And he said, well, um, he was a real consensus-oriented kind of manager. He's like, well, let's have a vote. Let's get together, you know, Jay Allard and Mitch Koch and all the my direct reports, and we'll just vote to see whether Halo should have an extra year or not. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. It needs a, a year or it's going to suck, and Halo's our most important brand at this point. It's like, well, I'd like to have this vote. I'm like, all right, fine. So we'll, we get together, all the senior managers under him, and he goes around and asks each group, marketing, sales, you know, Xbox Live, blah, blah, blah. And every single one votes, no, they should ship it on the original schedule. Oh, I walked out of the meeting and I, I threatened to quit right then. Um, and I said, there's no way I'm going to do that. It's going to happen, you know, over my dead body kind of thing. And uh, that was a dumb idea to have that anyway. And it just shows why you shouldn't run <laughs> product development this way. <laughs> but anyway, um, but that was sort of the world at that time. And... The fa I won the battle for Halo 2. I won them the extra year. And even then, you saw the final product. I mean, it was somewhat rushed. <laughs> the ending is like, what? Um, well, it sounds like they were, we were spared a huge disaster, though. Oh, imagine what it would have been like a year earlier. Um, but Halo was the easiest battle for me to win. Imagine the smaller projects where there's not as much at stake and not as much clout. And that's... Within six months of that meeting, I was gone. I left because it was just that same thing over and over again. Thinking so. about projects like Halo Wars, Age yeah, of Empires, just, and, or I guess an Ensemble. Were you there when they uh, were shuttered? Uh, that was long after I left. Oh, long after. Yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of good groups got shut down after I left. It's too bad. Yeah. I was kind of wondering in your since you have quite a bit of experience in this, uh, these sorts of questions. I mean, how do you know when's the right time to, to let a project go uh, versus giving them that extra time, those extra resources? I mean, where do you, is there, do you have like a checklist or criteria that you use or is this kind of a gut feeling? We would have product review meetings quite regularly. A lot of what I did was go around and look at different projects. I'd probably have 60 projects going on at any one time. And so um, uh, have periodic review meetings 
typically, though, when things were really screwed up, everybody knew they were screwed up. And so either there was a small core of people who were lying about it, <laughs> you know, which happens sometimes, but mostly everybody knew they were screwed up. And, um, and there were some cases where, um, where they really, where they got it together, you know, like, uh, I think about like Mech Commander 2, Mech Commander 2 got off the rails and I basically gave them one last chance to, to fix it. Um, and they came back with a much improved version the next meeting. And, um, and we ended up going forward with the product and it was reasonably successful. Um, the worst ones are ones that drag on and on. And by the time you get around to canceling them, you realize you should have canceled them years before, you know, um, and you wasted a lot of time and a lot of money. And um, I don't know. It, it, the real question is sort of where does success come from? And that's a hard, hard question. Um, I, I see I see certain kind of similarities among groups that have done really good work, um, but um, differences too. So it, it, there's no one there's no one answer to that question. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I think I've got uh, just enough for a uh, one more installment with Mr. Ed Freeze. A lot of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned for that. Um, also, I want to thank you very, very much, guys. If you have supported Matt Chat uh, financially through uh, Patreon or PayPal, it really means a lot to me, guys. You have uh, no idea. Uh, so if you would like to support the show, uh, please just go to the link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Uh, you can also support the show by buying games from GOG uh, using my affiliate link. And uh, by the way, uh, I just we just finished up last night a probably one of the best uh, Matt Chat Google Air Hangouts ever. Had a, a special guest, Neil Hawford, show up. Uh, he was just telling fantastic stories. Uh, you really would you really wish I should have been there. It's just really awesome stuff. I'm, I'm planning to uh, to post that uh, for you, uh, Patreon my uh, Patreon supporters. So. Uh, stay tuned. Just look at the Patreon site. You should see a, a link to that uh, recording. Uh, let's see. What about the news from the Matt Cave? Oh, well, oh, lots of stuff. Uh, Thamer sent me a really funny, uh, really fun trailer for a game called Pixel Heroes a Bite and Magic. I didn't know quite what this was when I started to watch this trailer, and then I sort of realized what they were uh, what they were doing with it. Really hilarious. Really well done. I definitely recommend it. Uh, I actually bought the game. I, I like the trailer so much I just bought the game uh, without, <laughs> you know, without looking at any uh, reviews or anything. Uh, so I haven't even played it yet, so I've, I can't really say anything about the game, but I'll definitely put a link to that trailer because I think you should see that. Uh, let's see what else. Apparently, I think this was uh, Shane Stack sent this in. Uh, Wizards of the Coast is sending out cease and desist orders uh, for people that are hosting these uh, online uh, D and D fifth edition character generators. Apparently, they're being nice about it, but it, <laughs> you know, it seems kind of lame to me. I'm not really a big fan of Wizards of the Coast, and this really doesn't do much to uh, <laughs> change that. At least not for the better. Uh, let's see some positive news. Uh, uh, Nathan Talbert, long, long a term uh, friend of the show and a personal friend, uh, sent me a game. Uh, this is Quest for Glory 1, So You Want to Be a Hero. That's uh, the VGA and EGA DOS version uh, from Sierra Coal Creations. Wow. Really, really nice box. Just uh, really beautiful work here. Uh, he was kind of worried that it would be damaged in the in the shipping, but uh, actually came through really nice. And it's going to look really good on the old shelf of honor here. <laughs> You know, if you guys have shelves like this, I'd really like to see them. So if you wouldn't mind, please, uh, you know, if you have a video, send me a link to that or even uh, some pictures. I'd like to see uh, your collections. Okay, well, let's see about that ale of the week. Uh, this week I've got a Sierra Nevada, one of my favorite breweries. Of course, they're out of uh, California. Let's see, we're specifically Chico or Chico or Chico, uh, California. It's <laughs> one of those, I guess. And Mills River, North Carolina. Hmm. I guess they must have two different breweries now. 
Uh, spring seasonal, available one time only. This is the 2015 Beer Camp Hoppy Lager. Alcohol 7% by volume, so very respectable. Uh, 55 IBU, let's see up here. Uh, this hop heavy beer combines this intense citrus and floral hop flavors with a clean classic malt body of a hearty blonde lager <laughs> uh, for a crisp but aggressive take on the India style pale lager. Uh, let's see, last summer we teamed up with San Diego's Ballast Point for a hop head twist on a lager, blah, blah, blah. Whole cone, whole cone hops. Man, I'm telling you, I've really been wanting to get into brewing my own beer. <laughs> and I read about all these different kinds of hops, and a hop torpedo, I, you know, it's, it, the, it sounds interesting, you know, all the terminology. I have really no idea uh, what it all means. I just like to taste it, but it'd be pretty cool to get into that side of it, too, I suppose. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this 2015 beer camp. Hoppy Lager here in the rather excellent drinking horn. You can definitely smell the hops on this. Nice, a toasty sort of aroma. It smells really good. Sort of, sort of a, I always think of it kind of as a, a nutty-like flavor or a nutty-like uh, smell to it. Kind of like uh, some roasted peanuts or something. Uh, anyway, really, really uh, smells good. Uh, let's give it a taste, though. Well, this this definitely uh, packs a bit of a punch in terms of the flavor. I uh, really uh, there's a lot of going on here. You definitely get some hops. It's kind of a, a high up, you know, sort of like I'm almost tasting this on my nose. <laughs> you know, it's it's a very sort of high up uh, uh, flavor there. Let me try it again. And it's kind of tickling my uh, my nasal passages a little bit. It's kind of strange, uh, but it tastes are really good. Um, nice, thick, creamy consistency. The the flavor is great. It's just a little, just enough bitterness to kind of take the, uh, you know, the uh, sort of taste of the alcohol away. Um, just really good. Let's try it one more time. Yeah, overall a really good flavor. It's got a really nice finish to it. Um, really got nothing bad to say about this. It's kind of a shame that it's only a one-time thing. You know, I'd, <laughs> I'd like to have this again. It's kind of a shame. Uh, but anyway, really good choice here. So maybe you guys will be able to find that before it's too late. I'm going to go a full 5 out of 5 drinking horns on it. Uh, Beer Camp from Sierra Nevada. Really good choice. Highly recommend it. All right, let's uh, wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, I found a quotation from one of my uh, favorite artists, mostly because of his uh, connection to my <laughs> favorite computer. <laughs> but anyway, it's Andy Warhol. And uh, I really like this quotation. I think it uh, would apply to a lot of us doing YouTubes or uh, YouTube videos or anything you guys might be doing. Anyway, it goes something like this. Don't pay any attention to what they write about you. Just measure it in inches. See you guys next week. Bill Gates is going to help The Rock become a broadband mogul, um, you know, MS-DOS, NT, uh, things like that. It, it's computer stuff. You wouldn't know anything about that, but, uh, you know, he's going to help The Rock with that. Finally, Bill Gates hooked up with The Rock. Smelt The Rock is cooking.